Maybe you've traveled somewhere at some point in time and you were heading off for a certain destination. You get in the car, you get all packed up, whatever the situation may be. And somewhere along the way, as you're driving, uh, you get turned around. Sometimes that can happen through a detour. Maybe you stopped off, the kids need to go to the bathroom, and then when you came out of the gas station and then you just didn't take that right turn and uh, you began heading somewhere and you just, you just got, got turned around. That happened to you before. It's kind of happened to all of us at some point in time, I think. And here are some things that kind of let you know that you're heading in that wrong direction. Uh, first, you start to get a bad feeling and you just are driving and you think, I don't know if this is right anymore. And then your wife wakes up from her nap and says, where are we? And that also uh, is not really, really good. And then you got the road signs. And as you're driving and all the road signs that you're looking at, you don't really recognize, but they're all really saying one thing, dude, turn around. You got all of this together and you're just kind of heading in the wrong direction. Well, sometimes in our own lives, as we're following in the walk with the Lord, God will begin to bring all of these things in to show us, to tell us, dude, just, just turn around. You're heading in the wrong direction. And if you will take your copy of God's word and join me in the book of Acts chapter three, the title of the message today is a change of direction. And there is a process by which God will use to change our direction in our walk with Jesus Christ. And so I want to consider together this process. And the first part of that process is the setup. You'll have the setup. God will set you up first, and then he'll speak into your life to change your direction. And so there's always this, this setup. So in Acts chapter 3, I want you to consider the setup as we go through it. Let me just read the first couple verses for us this morning. It says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And so this is kind of our setting for us in this story. And so here's the information that we're given. Uh, Peter and John are going up together at the hour of prayer. Now, Peter and John, this is just a side street, you often see them together. Uh, In fact, a, a study on spiritual gifts, if you've ever done one of those, Peter would represent that gift of prophecy, and what you see in the gift of John is this gift of mercy, and you'll always find these two gifts kind of together. Uh, that is a side street, but just in their own life, they're, they're together. In fact, if you remember when they go to check out the empty tomb, who's on their way? Peter and John, right? Remember, John gets there first. Uh, and the discussions that we have of the Lord's Supper in that upper room, who are the ones talking? Peter and and John. In fact, when it came down to, you know, who was going to die first, all that discussion's kind of wrapped around Peter and John. Like, well, what about John? What's going to happen to him? And he says, Peter, you follow me. And so this is just a side note to show you, you'll often find these two characters just uh, together. But there they are. They're on their way to the temple together and at the hour of prayer. That's 3 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon. And so that kind of helps us later on in this story. Uh, later, and they're there to pray. This would have been a popular time to be at the temple, and so it was kind of an ordinary routine in the early days of the church. You'll eventually see there's a, that split will end up happening, and then, you know, of course, uh, several years later, that temple will be destroyed, which is really unnecessary. So uh, there's the information about Peter and John. Then you got this lame man. He's just not even given a name, just a certain lame man. And uh, it says he's lame from birth. He can't stand, can't walk. In fact, he's got to be carried. Someone had, part of their daily routine was to get this man to this certain place. And the location is uh, a particular gate before you would go into the temple area. And there were lots of gates you could have gone through, but here, this one is called the beautiful gate. 
And so that would have been a popular entrance, right? And so not just any gate, but that gate that kind of, it looked the best. It had Corinthian bronze, they say, on it, and it looked really nice. And so you got a popular time and a very popular place, and that would have been very good if you're, kind of, if you're a beggar. You go there at this particular time, you want to go to that popular entrance. And so uh, it's just kind of interesting to note that the information tells us they're all there, but they're all there for different reasons. Peter and John going to pray. This guy's there to go to beg for alms. And uh, this is kind of a setup for uh, what's coming. And then there is going to be an even bigger setup here in a moment. But I want you to notice the interruption it comes in verse 3. If you look with verse 3, it says, Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And so now this story kind of zones in a little bit further, and I'd like to just point your attention to this phrase right here. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple. It's this picture of they're almost there, and maybe they're kind of on that last step. They're getting ready to go in, and at this very moment, here's the lame man. He sees them and then asks for alms. Alms is charity, anything. I mean, what they want is money, and that's what this man wants, but it was anything that you can give. If that had been some food, just, just whatever, uh, hopefully money, and just, just trying to get a little bit of mercy. And so... Here they are about to go in, and I just want to pose this question for you. Uh, do you like to be interrupted just before you're about to do something? Uh, that's typically not in our nature, right? So we're about to whatever, and then for me, that's the last moment I want someone to say, hey, because uh, we got our agenda. Uh, let me just say this. God sees nothing wrong with interrupting your plans for his. I've found that to be true. Uh, if you're about to do something and God wants to interject his own plan in that, he just doesn't see anything wrong with messing up our ordinary routine. And this is a routine. If you go back to verse 46 of chapter 2, if you just back up just a few verses, likely on the same page for you, verse 46 says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple. This, would have been, this was a daily routine. And so this is this interruption. It's actually a crucial moment in deciding what do you do in, with these interruptions. And so sometimes it's a change of direction. Maybe in this case, maybe there's something more important here than to be at this hour of prayer to go pray. Uh, we have this interruption. And I would just tell you for our own lives, walking in the Spirit means that you follow those promptings of the Holy Spirit right then and there and God just sees nothing wrong. We just need to get this in our heads that he sees nothing wrong with interrupting a routine, even if it's at the last moment. But there is a transition that takes place and that focus is now going to shift off the temple. Notice it's not on the hour of prayer. The focus is that the story is taking a dramatic turn. And if you look in verse 4, it says this, And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Look at us. So the focus then shifts, and uh, I kind of wonder, just as I'm reading this, uh, if maybe some of that old training kicked in. Because if you'll remember, remember they saw a guy this kind of in this similar area, and he was blind, and when they ran across this blind man, uh, they just asked Jesus, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents? They don't seem to be asking that question anymore. I mean, I think some, some training has kicked in, and now they're in this moment that now they, they are walking, and, uh, and when they see this, they're like, hey, I think God's working here, uh, just like they would have got from Jesus in that situation with the blind man. And they recognize this, and uh, they, they get involved. And so here's, here's the thing. We, God's got to get our attention first. He's going to get the attention of this lame man and some stuff's going to happen. But what we typically like to do is pray and say, God, would you just get the attention of the whole world? Would you get the attention of our country? Would you get the attention of this person in my family? Would you get the attention of whoever it is? And we have this person. And yet sometimes it may be God doesn't really have our attention first. 
I mean, before we can actually really get involved in the work of God, I mean, he's got to, he starts with his people. And we want God to get the attention of everybody, of everybody else, but sometimes we don't want to give him our own attention. And so the way this is working out is uh, God needs an interruption for us. He will come in and change our direction, give an interruption, and it'll start with his people first. And then it'll spread on from there, but he's got to get our attention. Now I want to talk about what's the purpose of this and God's intentions, and so now he can get the attention of others. Look at verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Well, now everybody's routine is messed, daily routine is messed up. <laughs> uh, so uh, this lame man is now involved. He's stand up. A miracle takes place. They're all walking in together. He's rejoicing. They're all walking in differently now, praising God and it all begins with just that one interruption. And it's a big, that, so those interruptions are a big deal. Let me just speak a few moments about this, what Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. Now, some churches may not be able to say that, but ours can. <laughs> silver and gold I, I, we don't have. And that's not a problem, right? Because what you possess is the real thing. And so, Peter says, look, I do have something that could benefit you that's far better. And for this guy, it is, he doesn't know what's coming. He would just seem to get alms, but God seems to give us really what we need, not what we want. And uh, I would tell you, we possess this same power today. Yes, it may look differently. The signs of the apostles, the way that worked, God would validate their message, and it would set up for something better. Uh, but for us today, maybe silver and gold we don't have, but as long as this church exists, we have the power of Jesus Christ every time we present his word before lost men and women. And so uh, it's always good to receive something that you need rather than what you want. But I'll, let me just show you this. God has the attention of the whole crowd. Look at verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And this right here you have is the setup. Do you see how this miracle sets up this crowd? They are seeing this guy praising God, acting a fool at the worship service. He is coming in and just he can't help it. It's genuine praise that burst out, doesn't care. I mean, this dude's been lame from birth, and now he can walk and have strength in his ankle bones, and uh, it's an absolute miracle, but don't miss the setup. The setup is now this crowd is taking notice, and they are coming in, and uh, all of this really starts with that one simple just interruption. Right as they are about to do something, it all changes from there. So getting off that routine is really good. In fact, I can remember a time uh, when uh, I had problems with, with my ankle. <laughs> this story, just I can't help but, but think of this. When I think about this guy, it just happened in reverse for me. So I was playing in a basketball league, and I go there to where they're playing, and my intention, my plan was to go there, play a basketball game, and after that, go hang out with our Bible study class. That was why I was there. In fact, what trips me up about even this own story as I think about it is I oftentimes was running late, so I didn't even, you know, I just got there, and I'm just there in time to play the game. Uh, this particular time, I was there a little bit early, so I was in my truck, and so I was like, I'm going to pray a little bit before I go in. And I just began to pray and was like, Lord, you know, just keep me safe today and, and uh, just praying for these things and thinking, all right, I'm good now. I'm covered. I'm going to go in and play a basketball game. And uh, 
before the game was over, I am running down through the middle, and I step on a guy's foot. And I know it immediately, but as soon as my ankle rolls, I, I knew it was bad. I've rolled my ankle plenty of times playing sports in high school, but this time I thought something, something went wrong, and I think I heard something that didn't sound good. And all I could do was crawl off the court. And kind of immediately I thought, dang, I prayed before I went in this place thinking I was going to be all right, and I never do that, so I thought I'd really be all right by doing that. And so all kinds of stuff just running through my head. And so, uh, man, we you know, go to the emergency room, kind of find out. Long story short, I tore three tendons in my right ankle. However, that interruption into that plan proved to be incredibly significant for my life. And so uh, it was my right foot. That meant I couldn't drive. And my job, I needed to drive. I drove to all kinds of different appointments as a salesman. And so I had to take like a leave off of work and I couldn't do anything. And so I found myself begging for alms, begging for rides, begging for a ride to church. I was having people from my Bible study class that were taking me to my classes at school. And so I hear my, here I am kind of begging and uh, it was kind of a humbling thing and just trying to make a sandwich was, was crazy. Just being, you don't realize how much you need something until you kind of have it missing. And uh, so, uh, but what began to happen is getting out of my ordinary routine. It got me into this place that when I was having a quiet time one morning, man, God spoke into my life. And what happened, it, there needed to be this setup. There needed to be something to get me to this place where I would listen. And I was reading one morning, I still have it in my journal, uh, the day that I was called into the ministry. And it was through even just tearing up my ankle that God spoke into my life and just grabbed a hold of me and I would tell you these interruptions into our life will be, they are really big deals when we do something with that. But I was stuck. Here's the other thing. When I was looking back in my journal, I was kind of preparing this message, and so I went back to look in my journal just to look at that moment. I like to revisit it, and I just think, man, I just remember that day. I mean, God just spoke, thundered in my heart. I knew what he was telling me to do, and there was this sense of urgency. I mean, an overwhelming just... I mean, just incredible moment that I had with God. Well, I started turning back even before that, and I was starting to read some prayers before that actual day. And just maybe a, a few months before that day, I was kind of reading this prayer I'd prayed in my journal that I'd wrote down. And the prayer was, God, would you help me fix my eyes on you? And I hadn't really seen that before until this week. I'd usually go back to that moment, but as I was kind of traveling beyond that, and I thought, man, God, you sure do have a way of getting me to fix my eyes on you, because that moment, just a few months later, that's exactly what he did. And I would tell you, uh, these interruptions may be inconvenient in our life. They may kind of throw us all out of whack, but I'm telling you, it may be, it just may be, that's exactly what God intended. That was his intention for that interruption. And, uh, they're incredible if we will let God change our direction through them. And so let me just ask you just a simple question. Is God doing anything in your life to maybe change your direction? Has he allowed an interruption to come in that maybe just threw your whole world out of whack for a moment and broke that routine that you so appreciate? I appreciate a routine, don't you? I kind of like it. I like getting in one and like just kind of doing it. But uh, I've found that God's plans are just more important to him than mine are. And so my routine, really, on the grand scheme of things, doesn't mean a whole lot to God. And uh, he feels just incredible freedom, I think, to break into that, interrupt that, so that his plan and purpose can come out. And so if you would say, yeah, I got an interruption, well, it may be just the setup for you for something that's coming that's really, really good. So... This section that we just looked at is the setup. So what is it setting up? Well, the setup is for the sermon. Now you have this purpose. What's this setup? All this has happened. Yeah, we're thankful for the miracle and all this, but I want to tell you about the sermon because the sermon is the real event. 
And I'm not just saying this as your preacher just because I love preaching, and, and I do, but the sermon is the event. The sermon is the real event. Uh, it's not the burning bush. The burning bush is the setup. You get that, right? Let me take you back in the wilderness with Moses. He sees this bush, this miracle. It's a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning. Well, you know, that was just a setup for a sermon, right? Because what that burning bush did, it set him up, drew Moses on in for the sermon, which was Moses, Moses. By the way, take your sandals off. You're stepping on holy ground. I got a plan for you. And so God interrupted a shepherd's daily routine out there in this wilderness with a miracle, and it was a setup for what's coming next. And so many people will preach this passage, and they'll hone in on this miracle. And it's an incredible miracle. That's fine. God can do whatever he wants. I, I'm fully fine with that. But I'm telling you, you can't read this story and not get the fact that this is merely a setup for something that's coming, and that's the burning bush. And now we got the real event that we're going to look at in our text, which is the sermon. And all the preachers out there said, amen. Yeah, it's about the sermon. And so look at the sermon, just the very first part of it. Look at verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, I wonder what that looked like, just clinging on to him. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Now, I've preached a lot of sermons. I don't know how many, but I've preached a lot of sermons. And here's one thing I've never had happen to me. I've never had once where people were running to hear it. I mean, I have people come in late, I've had people come in that maybe just don't want to be there. I've had some that do, and they're like, yeah, I want to hear a, a word from God, and, and uh, that's all good. But I've never had a sermon where I was already here at the church, and then you're looking out in the parking lot, and I kind of love where my office is, by the way. You don't know if you realize that I can see y'all when y'all come in, and I can look out there, and everyone's adjusting and coming on in or getting my, whatever, and it's, I love it. It's fun. But I've never seen a parking lot, man, cars rushing in and people just running up into this sanctuary going, I want to hear the sermon. Like, I've never seen that before. And so I can't imagine as a preacher, what would this be like? And notice John's not going to say anything. You're going to see this gift come out of Peter, and he's going to look at these people, and, uh, and he's about to preach this sermon. They all come to this part. It's a part of the temple, kind of a colonnade with columns. It's covered, called Solomon's Porch. Uh, or portico, and they're all greatly amazed, and so they're ready to hear the sermon. You know why? Because they've had this setup that's happened in their life for them to hear it. And so God's sermon to the lost. These are lost people, okay? They don't know Jesus Christ. Yes, they are Jewish. Uh, they are there. They're pious. They're there to pray, right? It's 3 o'clock. I mean, they're, they're here to pray, but they are lost. And so I want you to show you what would a sermon look like to lost people, and they typically have these three stages. And I want to show you this first stage that's in the sermon, and it's called the revelation. That's where God reveals something to you. Uh, look when verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? It's like saying, we didn't, we didn't do this. Why? It's not because I had an extra prayer before this morning before I came. It's not me. And so verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. So Pilate, in this one case, was going to let him go, but y'all said, no, we just kill him, crucify him. And in verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life. So it's, you kill someone who takes life, and, or, and I'm sorry, you want someone who takes life and kill the one who's the author of life. And so these are these paradoxes that Peter's given through here. And whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. We have saw personally the resurrection. In verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. 
And so Peter is now clarifying this miracle. This should sound familiar. Remember in Acts chapter 2, you have all these different languages underneath heaven. They're all being able to hear this, and it's kind of a, this miraculous event. And uh, Peter has to step in and clarify that for him. These guys aren't drunk. Here's what, it's a prophecy of Joel. Then you got this lame man, this miraculous event, and you got people running, going, what's going on? What's happening? They're looking in the wrong direction. They're confused, looking like Peter did something. And Peter's... No, let me clarify this for you. And so here is the revelation. It's faith in Jesus Christ that has brought power into this man's ankle bones that's allowed him to stand. That very same power flows from the God that you crucified. And so here is the revelation in the sermon. The revelation is it goes out to people and tells them they're not right with God. That's essentially what it is. If you got a lost crowd and you got a sermon that is going to impact a lost crowd, there's going to be some revelation from God that says you're not right with him. And in fact, you're not even close to being right like you think you are. And so it's a, a revelatory event when you recognize that really why Jesus Christ came and to die was your fault. It's because of your sin. And your sin placed him there, and he died for you. Think about the revelation, though, for these people. These people think they're right with God. And for me, this would be the hardest one to get on board. Because you could take someone out in the world that's just consumed in their sin and consumed in their lostness and helplessness. You could take someone out there, and it probably won't take them to, much to convince them yeah, I'm, I'm probably not right with God, just looking at all the evidence. I, if God really is holy, as the Bible says, I wouldn't, based on all this, I don't think I'm right. But you take somebody that goes to church. You take someone that goes to the hour of prayer, someone that's got a religious aspect in their life, and you want to try to convince that person they're not right with God? Good luck. However, it's the power of the Word of God. And as you just preach or teach on the Word of God, God will take this and give someone a revelatory moment. And what God will tell that person is, you're not right with me. You're not right. And uh, that may be hard for us to admit, but it's a really good thing to admit if we're not, isn't it? I mean, would you want to just go on thinking you're right with God but really not be? I mean, how would you like to walk out of here today going, you know, I, I think I'm good and I, I really don't want to be told that I'm not right with God, and so I'd rather think I'm right with God than to really just get right with God. Would y'all want that to be you? You get in your car and drive away thinking you're right with God, but you're really not right with God? I don't want to be there. I would want an interruption. I'd want something to tell me, get me out of this ordinary routine, to tell me you are not right with God. And God will do that. He will do that with anybody, and he will do that with those who think they're right with him. But with this revelatory moment comes with an admission. You are going to have to admit that you are not right with God. But in order to do that, uh, you need to do something. And that brings us to the second stage of the sermon. You got the revelation. The second stage is repentance. So revelation comes in. What are you going to do with that? Well, if you're not right with God, you repent. And that's in the second stage. Look in verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so I'm going to talk about the latter part of this sermon, but let me just stay in the second stage just for a moment. Repentance. If God has revealed something to you, he's prodded on you, and you know it because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Oftentimes that's how you know when it's God speaking to you is because it's, sometimes it's not what you really wanted to hear, but it's something that you needed to hear, which that's exactly what God does. And so what God will do, he speaks into that, and it's going to make you uncomfortable for a second, and then these moments are crucial. These next few moments, in fact, some, in some cases, your eternity could hinge upon it. But repentance is crucial. And so what Peter is saying is, look, you cannot claim ignorance anymore. 
Yes, you did all this in ignorance. I mean, y'all were, were, were just trying to get rid of him. And God had his own plan by crucifying him, all of this stuff. And you're, you're, but you can't claim ignorance anymore. The moment you hear truth, guess what? It's the curse of knowledge. Now you know. You can't, you can't say, well, I didn't know that. Now, with this knowledge comes a responsibility. And once you hear a sermon, you're now held responsible. You're not going to be able to stand before God and say, I, I didn't hear or I didn't know. I, I, you, there's, it removes all the excuses out of this equation. And because once you hear the sermon and you're brought to this moment of repentance, uh, you're held accountable for that. And... Uh, and it's an incredible responsibility. So they can't claim ignorance anymore. And the time has now come, this crucial moment, to repent. And what repent is, it's a change of direction. You were going in this one direction. You were heading in that direction. And then along the way, God has brought signs into your life. And as you're heading down this road, you become convinced in your mind that there needs to be a change of direction, but you get so convinced that you actually turn around. And when you get so convinced in your mind that you're like, this is the wrong path, I gotta get on this path, I'm going in the wrong direction, the moment you do that, what you've demonstrated is what the Bible calls repentance. That is repentance. It's, it starts kind of, you become convinced, and then it, it, it reorients your whole way of life. It changes your direction. And oftentimes, to get someone to repent, you know what they need? They need a setup. They need something to set them up for that. And so they're not going to just drive down the road and all of a sudden just go, whoop, and just make a 180 without being convinced that that's what they need. And so here's our sin problem. We are so convinced that once we get in the right direction, uh, nothing's going to get us off of it. So it takes God to bring in an interruption to really get us out of that so that we will make a change of direction. Uh, in my case, it was a broken ankle that still, to me, this day kind of bothers me, but it always reminds me of that moment. In fact, you know, right before I came to Robinwood, I had just finished my last day of physical therapy. Not the last day because uh, that was a part of the plan. It was the last day because I was done. I, I was like, this hurts, and I just kind of threw in the towel. But it it, it all lined up to where, man, that moment proved to be significant. And without that moment, uh, I'm not here. I guarantee you that. And I don't know about anybody else, but I would rather be here than going still playing church basketball league stuff somewhere, still trying to convince myself that I'm still good because I'm not. And uh, uh, this is far better. What comes after the interruption is far better then that ordinary routine you think you're stuck in. Think about this. If that ordinary routine is going to lead you to hell, wouldn't you be glad for an interruption? Even if it was something so devastating to you or to your fan, whatever it takes, wouldn't that interruption still be good if it got you off a path to hell and put you on a path to eternal life? That would be, that'd be better. I don't know about y'all, but to me, that, that's better. It is better. And so... Repentance. You got to change your direction. And when you get this revelatory moment, this setup, man, you got to get convinced. And then what will happen is you'll get this third stage. Here's this third stage of the sermon, and, that, and that's the results. Let me just take you back into verse 19 where it says, Repent, therefore, and be converted. And here's the results. Here's what will happen your sins be blotted out. Blotted out is like obliterate, it's a word that doesn't mean just wipe away, it means there's nothing, there's no remnant left. I mean, it is absolutely just gone. And that's what repentance will do for you. I don't care what you've done on whatever road that you took off on. And whatever sin has consumed your life, that moment you repent, I'm telling you, you get forgiveness. And it just obliterates that. And that's really good, isn't it? Forgiveness of sins. And then you get this. Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So... Down this road, what you're accruing upon yourself is some filthiness. And what you're accruing with this sin is you're accruing weight upon your life. And it's adding weight. It even maybe can affect you physically. I mean, you're just accruing and building this up. But the moment you repent and get forgiveness, it's like you get a bath. And all this filth is removed. 
And all that stuff is gone, and there's this incredible weight that's lifted on you. And that weight is described as the wrath of God. For God's wrath remains upon you until you repent. And when you repent, it is lifted up off your life. And I'm telling you, it's a, an incredible moment when you receive forgiveness, and it all hinges upon this word, repent. Now, without repentance, there is no hope for forgiveness. Without repentance, there is no hope for this time of refreshing that comes from the presence of God. There is no hope of eternal life without repentance, without turning to God in faith and getting off that. And so let me, he is going to spend a lot of time in this. He's got a Jewish audience convincing them of their history about how Jesus fulfills this. So I'm going to read this, but I'm going to get to the money verse, okay? So let me read this. Hang with me. Look in verse 20. And so here's the other result. So it's, here's what God wants to do. He, wants, he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his prophets, uh, holy prophets, since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So he says, look, Moses spoke about this prophet that's coming. Yes, and all the prophets spoke about him. From Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. These days, the ones you're living in. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he's like, Abraham, this has to do with Abraham. You see how hard it is to convince someone that thinks they're right with God? You see what you got to go to? You're trying to go to great lengths. Just, I'm trying to convince you of this. You think you're right with God, but you're not. Incredibly difficult. That's why it's got, you got to have revelation from God to do it. Verse 26. Here's, here's the result. Here's what God wants to do. And it's an incredible verse. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. And turning away every one of you from your iniquities. God has interrupted your life. He has sent Jesus not to make your life worse. He's done this to bless you. He wants to bless the So that he can bless you because if you're going to go down that path away from him, that is not a path God can bless. You cannot expect God's blessing on a path that he has not ordained for your life. What kind of God do you think we serve? you think we can go down a direction, sin, and just live by the seat of our pants and just fulfill every heart's desire and think God is going to bless that? God's not going to do that. In fact, Sometimes people do this and go, and then when something bad happens, they go, where's God? Where are you at? What are you doing? And we live in a nation that thinks we can just do whatever we want and think we're going to have God's blessing on that. No. We need repentance going all the way from the top to the bottom. you got to have repentance. You cannot just go down a path that's your own and think God is obligated to bless you, have all of his resources behind you, to provide for you. When he is, that's not a plan he's ordained. But if you will repent and turn your butt around, you are now in a position for God to bring some good things into your life. You're in a position for God to forgive you, to restore you to bless you, to get these times of refreshing, to bring some really good things, even in all of his resources, whatever it takes for you to walk in this new plan. That's why, for me, for our church, and you'll hear this tonight at the business meeting, silver and gold we don't have. And honestly, I, I actually kind of fine with that. At first, when I think about it, I'm really not. But when I really start thinking about it, God, if I'm on your plan, then it's your job to provide for this church. If if we're preaching the gospel and you really want us to be here, then you provide. But if we're going to go down a path that is not a path that he's ordained, then we should never expect God's resources to be behind that. But I think, man, if we get in the center of God's will, I don't care if the silver and gold is there or not. If there's the power of Jesus Christ, I'm good with that. I'm absolutely good with it. And so 
these results, these three stages. Revelation, you're not right with God. What do I do with that? Repent. That third stage, when you repent, all these results, man, come into your life. But some miss out on that repent stage and they don't do it. And uh, just don't let that be you because these results aren't yours if you don't do that. So here's the deal. We got the setup. In fact, here's the com- kind of one part of the completion. That lame man being healed is going to play all the way into chapter 4 and then some. So that's how big of a setup it was. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. I'm just going to read these three verses to show you, kind of put a bow on it for today. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, these guys don't believe in the resurrection. That's going to come up. And the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people, and look at this, and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. These people get mad, but look, they're too late. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So probably a couple hours have gone by. However, many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000 people. Do you see the setup now? Without this lame man, you don't get any of this. This lame man caused a stir so that people could run and hear a sermon, and those that believed and repented, sure there were some that didn't, but 5,000 people come into the fold that day. And this is the last time that they count. This is the last time that we'll get a number. Because here's the thing. As the gospel goes out, it's going to multiply. So they're not going to be able to keep up with it. Because it's going to spread beyond Jerusalem. It's going to go out everywhere. And so they're going to stop keeping track of it, not because they don't care about numbers, but because they can't count them. And so this was an incredible setup for a sermon that brought 5,000 people into the family. Well, here's the thing about your life, okay? You've heard a sermon today. Whether it was good or not, we table that for another time. But we can all agree on one thing, you've heard a sermon. Which means you've likely already had a setup. People online, they've already had a setup for this sermon. And that setup may have come on Saturday. That setup may have come last week. That setup may have come a long time ago. But the Holy Spirit of God, through his word, can bring it all back up for this one moment. And this one moment today has brought us to this crunch time, what we call repentance. And so you're going to have an opportunity to do that. You've got a sermon. You've got a setup. The question for you is, as we do this last song, is what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? I would sure hate to walk out of here today thinking... I'm right with God if I'm not. God, bring an interruption into my life if that's the case. Do something. I I don't want to be thinking I'm good. If I'm not good, tell me. And the good news is God will do it. God will step into your life and show you, reveal to you, that maybe you're just not right with him like you thought you were. And that's okay because the good news is that's why he showed you so that he can bless you, so that he can turn you into a whole new direction. And so, just kind of think in your own mind for a moment. You got an interruption? Something happened? I don't know what, but maybe whatever's coming. You got your interruption? I got my interruption. If you got your interruption in your mind, then he's got something really important to share with you. And it's got more to do than just you. If God's changing your direction you realize that it's not just to bless you, but he can bless others through you. I mean, incredible, incredible story about a whole group of people turning around. But when God turns you around, man, he can reach a lot more people through your life. And so the plans always have to do with more than just you. But let God not only disrupt your life, change your life and repent. Now, today as we get ready to close, you got some revelation. God spoke to you and said, look, you're really not right with me. God's speaking right now. You need to change your course of direction. And I've brought an interruption into your life, but if this isn't going to work, i got a bigger interruption for you. It will get worse if you're going to continue down this. 
And so just maybe, just maybe, you on that last step, you just about to take that last step. And this is the last minute. God is stepping in at the last moment for, of you, and this is, this is it. Man, I sure love for God to interrupt me at the last moment if I'm about to take my last step in that last direction. I just soon repent today. And so maybe today you think, I'm on this, I'm on this direction, and I, you know, I heard you pray. I'm going to keep going. Well, it may be this is your last step. Maybe you don't make it back next Sunday. It, you, he, you're just about to go in. But today God has interrupted you. Today God has said, repent, you're not right, and get that back right. Why in the world would you risk that? If God's Spirit has spoken, you got the setup, you got the sermon, repent today. And I'm telling you, God will bless you, and you're in a position for God to restore and forgive. Would you stand to your feet now? As you do so, would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Here we are in this moment. Maybe it's the last step, maybe not, but I sure wouldn't risk it. You're going to keep going, but God has now interrupted. He's spoken. Today is time to repent. I encourage you to do that. Our Heavenly Father, we come here in these crucial moments. And Lord, it would be our desire that not only would you interrupt our life, but that you would show us now what we need to do with it. And so God, you have spoken today. And Lord, as we grapple with that, I pray that you would lead us to repentance. I pray that you would lead us in these next few moments to turn from that direction we were headed down and begin a new walk. A walk that is one you can bless, a walk that is in the center of your will. And Lord, I pray as we leave here today, we would experience the first fruits of those results, that there would be times of refreshing that would just be poured out right now, that there would be someone today who would display genuine repentance and walk out of here forgiven and newness of life and just praising God for what you have done. We give this time to you now. Please may the power of Jesus Christ be present today as we repent. So today for you, here you are, you're in that moment. God has spoken. It's simple. Change direction, repent. As we sing this last song, you can do that where you're at. If you want to come to these steps and pray, I'm here to pray with you if you would like. But however it works out, let's repent today and get off that other direction. As we sing this song, won't you come?